guys are welcome to go. Okay, so I guess I'm supposed to acknowledge the, the recording, right? Yeah. Okay, I, I did, so we're good. Um, all right, welcome everyone, and thank you for asking us to, to join you for this hour. Um, as Catherine introduced us, I'm Rob Rizani. I'm here with Maddie Gandhari, a, a partner in a forensic accounting firm that we're both members of. Um, and uh, the topic of today is going to be fraud and forensic accounting. Now, uh, I heard that you guys are going to have a meeting with the IRS tomorrow and you're going to learn about tax accounting. I also recall that we had this very club had a meeting last week with government uh, uh, agencies representing various government uh, agencies, uh, which, as you might recall, was one of the uh, one of the, the uh, speakers on the panel. So you may be wondering, what is this guy doing? Does he do everything? Why is he here one week talking about the IRS and taxes? And he's saying that's the best job in the world. And then now he's here talking about something else. Uh, which one do we believe? So let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I have been with the IRS for 30 years. Uh, in fact, a little over 30 years. In uh, July this year, it'll be 31 years. Um, and uh, I joined the IRS shortly after graduating. My, my parents put me in the university shortly after I was born. So I graduated when I was five. And that I believe that makes me about like 35 right now, right? Uh, so if, if you believe that, uh, you can leave the meeting right now because you guys would not make good forensic accountants. But, but anyway, um, the reason I switched, I, upon graduation, I started working for a private accounting firm. Um, I stayed there for a couple of years and I switched to the industry and I eventually made my way to the government with the IRS. And one of the reasons was because I was tired of working those 60 hour weeks in public accounting or in private industry accounting. Uh, that has brought me here where I work about 70 to 80 hours a week uh, because in addition to having my full-time IRS job, I also teach extensively here at CSUN. Some of you guys are in my class, so you know that. Um, and I also have this part-time forensic accounting practice, which pretty much the three jobs take most of my waking hours. But I do it because I really enjoy it and I have a passion for the field, everything in the field. So when, when, when I told you working for the government is a great job, it is. But I am also a member of uh, the advisory board to the accounting department. Uh, and one of our functions is to, to support clubs like yourself and Alpha and, and Beta Alpha Psi and, and MISA. And, and one of the functions that we think is really important to, one of the roles that's really important to play is to bring all that's on the table out there as far as career opportunities and uh, fields of professional fields that you guys can get into so that you don't think necessarily that you're limited just to the traditional roles in accounting, which is mostly audit and tax. And you don't think that if I get out of school and don't end up working for one of the big four firms, um, I'm screwed, I'm out of it, nobody's going to give me a job. There is a lot of opportunity, a lot of different places to work for using your accounting skills. And what we talk about today is, is one of those. Uh, forensic accounting, I mean, I learned everything I know about forensic accounting working for the IRS because that is one of the skills that they teach you right away when, when you start working there is digging through financial records and finding things that people may not necessarily want to know. You may, uh, you may guess that not everyone wants to show the IRS what they make and what they have. And, and one of the skills they teach you is how to go and dig through financial records and unearth those. So I started that. I kind of got dragged into this financial accounting. Uh, I don't want to say dragged. It wasn't, it wasn't against my will, but it was a friend of mine that needed uh, help that was going through divorce. And his, his attorney needed some help digging through some financial stuff. So I offered to do them for free because anything I do outside of the IRS, I need to get permission uh, from my employer. 
Um, I did it for free and the attorney was really happy with my work and he urged me to, to ask the IRS if they'll allow me to do this on the side because he said he had a lot of other clients, a lot of other cases that, that I could help him with. And that kind of got me started in this and I'm not, I'm not sorry that I did. It's, it's been a really rewarding, uh, rewarding field. Um, then a few years ago, I got acquainted with Maddie here. Uh, unlike me, who's a more, mostly a tax guy with some forensic accounting skills, he is an all out forensic accountant. That's all he's mostly done all his life. Um, so he's got very strong data analytics skills uh, that are really useful. And we figured that we're kind of a match made in heaven because I have a full time job and I can put a lot of time into our practice, but I have the overall skills and I can kind of oversee things. Whereas he can actually do a lot of the actual work, data analytic work. And between the two of us, I can tell you that we, we compete with some of those big firms out there. And uh, in a lot of cases where we're engaged, we're able to do what a much bigger firm would be able to do for, for a fraction of the cost and just as much or more effectiveness. Anyway, uh, I think you gave Maddie sharing um, privileges. So Maddie, do you want to just share the slides and walk through them, uh, work through them? Do you want each of us to do that separately? Uh, I think each of, uh, each of us do is better because maybe okay. sometimes. All right, so in that case, uh, uh, Catherine, could you give me sharing privileges also? You should all have oh, I think the ability I do have to it. share screen. Yeah, it's the green button at the bottom. Got Very it. Bright. Yes. Okay, perfect. And so um, this is us. This is our firm, currently two partners. Um, and the name of our firm is uh, MSN Forensic Solutions, uh, or MSN Forensics for short. And we're happy to be partnering up with you and the Accounting Association to do this presentation and to be here for you as a resource to count on if you need help in any area. Um, so why are we here uh, to talk about forensic accounting? What does what forensic accounting mean anyway? Uh, the word forensic really comes from a Latin word, Latin word uh, forum, which as you all know, means a place to meet, uh, a venue where people meet and exchange ideas and try to resolve an issue. and uh, an offshoot of that is a Latin word forensis, which means in open court or in public, like in a public hearing. And the current modern word forensic kind of comes from that. It, it means anything that has to do with the court of law, with law. So basically forensic accounting is an area of knowledge and skill uh, that helps in, um, in determining the results in a legal action, either actual or pending legal action. So a lot, of, a lot of you guys may have seen TV shows like The Forensic Files. What does a forensic investigator do? They use some kind of body, body of knowledge to, to investigate and make determinations that's gonna be useful in, in a legal case. I mean, in the TV shows, it's always a criminal case, but it could be a criminal or a civil case. I mean, that body of knowledge could be bioscience, looking at some, dissecting DNA to see if there's a DNA match, uh, looking at fingerprints, looking at handwriting. All of those are investigative skills that are forensic skills. But what about accounting? I mean, accounting is a skill. And as you know, um, every financial transaction leaves a financial footprint that is very difficult to hide and it's impossible to, to erase completely. So somebody with accounting skills, if they're trained to use those accounting skills in an investigative way, um, th that knowledge, that skill can be used to discover facts or reach conclusions that, that can be useful in resolving a legal dispute. Whether, whether civil or criminal. 
um, beyond just getting like degrees in accounting, the bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, there, there are bodies of knowledge uh, that are specifically targeted and geared towards the, the field of forensic accounting. First of all, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants or the ICPA has specific training and a certificate program for forensic accountants. This is called uh, the Certification in Financial Forensics. Uh, one who achieves that is called the cert is Certified in Financial Forensics or CFF. That is a certificate that is granted by the AICPA. Uh, they also have an accreditation in business valuations, and one who achieves that becomes an accredited in business valuation, or ABV. Uh, as you're going to find out, uh, business valuations is one of the fields, subfields, or sub uh, set of the financial, the uh, forensic accounting, or at least forensic accountants are also usually also good at putting a value to a business, that's the, that's the business valuation. Uh, for both of these, you would need to be a CPA because you would need to become a member of the AI CPA. So if you're gonna go that route, you would need to put in some time once you graduate from your, with your accounting degree to get your CPA certificate um, and your CPA license, and then you can move on from there to become a forensic accountant on top of that. Uh, we also have the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, who, who is a worldwide um, association, worldwide organization dedicated to basically fighting fraud. And so as part of that is they do a lot of studies on how fraud occurs, where it occurs, how, what the extent of it is, how much damage, what kind of businesses are susceptible to fraud, what kind of fraud mechanisms there are and what, what are the best ways to fight it and to, to investigate and detect it. Um, so that has evolved into a body of knowledge into fraud investigation. And they also have a certificate program. So you, once you go through their training, you become a certified fraud examiner or CFE. And then we also have various other bodies of knowledge. One of them is, or organizations, one of them is national Association of Certified Valuations and, and uh, anal I'm sorry, analytic analysts, <laughs> National Association of Certified Valuations and Analysts, uh, and they grant a certificate just in business valuations, CVA. So their their thing is just business valuations. Um, there are others. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, going towards forensic accounting, these are some of the uh, websites to maybe go and check out. Uh, we'll, we'll, Isaac can, can provide you a copy of these uh, these slides and then these names are there. You can go check them out or you can always reach out to us and we'll give you more information. Uh, within the practice of forensic accounting, um, there, there are a lot of different uh, types of services that a forensic accountant can provide. Uh, first on top of the list is litigation services. So as a forensic accountant, you, you can bet on spending a lot of time with attorneys. Uh, you would either be a, a consultant to those attorneys, to the people uh, representing clients in a, in a legal matter, or you become an expert witness. So you, you would either be working behind the scene with the attorney, to prepare evidence so that they can present to court, or you're gonna be called upon yourself to, to testify in court, you become an expert witness. Um, beyond that, there are cases where there are no attorneys involved, or there may be attorneys involved, but they, they involve other, uh, other services, one being fraud investigations. We get a lot of calls. So more than half of our cases are from people that come to us and they say, I think somebody defrauded me or somebody defrauded me for sure. I just need to prove it. And the, our, our work begins from there. They, with the information that they provide, with the additional information that we go after either publicly or we ask them to get through legal channels and we answer their question. Yes, you've been defrauded. 
No, it's all in your imagination. Nobody's taking anything from you or somewhere in between. So that's all of that is fraud investigation. Uh, there's a field of digital uh, forensics, which is uh, rapidly gaining some momentum because we're moving into the information age and everything's stored in the cloud. So digital forensics is looking through computerized and digital records and trying to find evidence. You're trying to find information. You try to find uh, evidence of manipulation. People that did something, then they want to try to go back and hide their own tracks. Um, that is a fascinating field. And I think some of our case studies are going to show uh, how advanced we've become and what's really possible when you know the science to, to discover information. Matrimonial forensics has to do with people getting divorced. Uh, you may not think of that as much of an accounting thing, but a lot of times uh, when people are getting divorced, there's division of property where you have to help them figure out who brought what to the marriage, what who was taking what out, how much is worth, how much they owe each other. But also, a lot of times, more often than not, there's a question of income because one or both of those individuals have businesses and uh, these same people that are always telling people uh, how proud they are of their business and how much money they're making, all of a sudden when it comes to divorce and settling with their wife or with their husband, all of a sudden their business isn't making any money, they're all poor, there's nothing to to be because you know the spousal support is all based on how much the, the parties make, right? Um, so then it becomes the question of, oh no, my husband is making $10 million a year, he's lying about his income. So this is a question for the forensic accountants. Usually each side has its own forensic accountant. The, the two get together and they kind of collaborate and they provide a report to the attorneys or to the court as to how much money everybody's making. We have bankruptcy services. Uh, a lot of times forensic accountants are hired as, um, they are hired as trustees for a bankruptcy estate just to protect what's in there, make sure people are not taking money out of there, people are not selling uh, assets and taking the proceeds for their own personal use. Um, and also a lot of times there are allegations of bankruptcy fraud where a forensic accountant is engaged to, to investigate it. Economic damage assessments, we've had a lot of that this past few years because of COVID or because let's say you have somebody owns like a pizza shop shop and, and the ceiling collapses. So his business is shut down for like six months. Um, it will take a forensic accountant and his skills to figure out during those six months, how much income that person could have made that they were deprived of so that they can either go sue the person who was responsible for the the, uh, the ceiling collapsing or get reimbursement from their insurance company. But either way, that's some that's a determination that needs to be made using your accounting skills. And business valuations, as I said, is, is one of the pillars of uh, forensic accounting. Where is that useful? If someone wants to sell their business, they need to know what a good price would be for that. If somebody's buying a business, they want to know if they're paying a good price for the business they're buying. Um, so both of those would come to a forensic accountant and say, could you evaluate this business and tell me how much it's worth? Um, in a divorce situation where the husband is taking the, business, the, the family business and the wife, he needs to buy out his wife or vice versa. Uh, we have dispute between partners. One of the partners wants out. He wants to figure out how much the other partners need to pay him. All of those fall under the umbrella of business valuations and that is a whole universe all by itself knowing which approach to take to put uh, to, to do a business valuation um, you need to become familiar with like the economics macroeconomics microeconomics and uh, a lot of like finance what we learn in, in finance the Association of Fraud Examiners, the ACFE, one of their uh, products that they've, they've been able to develop over the years is the fraud tree that you see here. 
and this frog tree gives you all of the various uh, permutations where fraud can occur. They basically break out, this, this is all, they call this occupational fraud, fraud that occurs in a business. Um, it could be external, it could be internal, but either way, it, it falls into three broad categories. Uh, the first one being, and with your permission, I need to enlarge this a little bit because I can't, I can't really read. Okay, so we have three different categories of uh, occupational fraud. The first one on, on the very left of your screen is cor uh, corruption. Um, and that involves all inappropriate acts that can happen within a business, by a business owner, by an employee, uh, in, in collusion with somebody outside the business. And it doesn't involve stealing from the business. That, that falls in, under a different category. But it just falls, it involves doing inappropriate things, such as bribing a government official, bribing a foreign government, uh, colluding with vendors uh, or with customers so that they come and buy from the company so somebody can get a bigger commission. But, but that would usually mean you would sell to them below the, the authorized prices or you, you would sell to them uh, below the, with a, like a negative profit margin. So those, those are all involved, those all involve fraud. And those would be the job of, a, I'm sorry, Uh, that would be the job of a forensic accountant. That, that's one of the areas of fraud that a fraud examiner uh, would investigate. Uh, then we can jump to the right side of the screen where there's financial statement fraud. And this is something you guys are, because of your studies, are probably most familiar with. This is where somebody just uh, messes with their books. A company that tries to show that they made too much more money than they made, less money than they made. They have more in assets than they have. They try to hide liabilities, create a liability. I mean, all different reasons why people would want to misrepresent their financial situation. Usually somebody in a business is trying to show the world that their business is doing better, right? And so there's an incentive to create assets that don't exist, put assets on the books that don't exist, or create income that doesn't exist. So all of that is financial fraud, financial uh financial statement fraud. So we know that with big companies, their financial statements are audited by CPA firms, but those audits, they, they look for evidence that's, that's presented by, the, by their client. And sometimes the client uh, fraudulently gives them the wrong documents, phony documents, and you guys know when you're taking your auditing courses, an auditor is not responsible for that. They, they, if they've been defrauded, They've done their job. And so you can have audited financial statements that are fraudulent, or sometimes those auditors find indications of fraud. Once it gets to that, it goes beyond just normal auditing. Now it becomes into the world of financial, of forensic accounting. And the forensic accountant needs to get involved to, to find the fraud, who committed it, and why, and how much, and, and all the rest of it. And then what's in the middle? This one, this in the middle is. Um, asset misappropriation. This is where like an employee would steal from the company. Um, that could be cash, stealing cash, or it could be stealing other assets such as inventory, accounts receivable. So you see all the uh, permutations. There's a lot of uh, different ways people can steal. There are billing schemes where people collude with a vendor and get a refund and sent to them. They're, they're uh, billing. They're, they are sales schemes. They're payroll schemes. We have like a ghost employee set up on the books. Um, to whom a paycheck goes out every week and it goes to somebody's bank account. Uh, all of those, which we don't have time to go through one by one, but those are all each of those is a mechanism where somebody can steal from a company. So the ACFE has done an extensive study on all of these. There's about a chapter in the, in the ACFE handbook on each one of these types of fraud, how they're committed, 
uh, what the mechanisms are when somebody perpetrates them, and what investigative techniques should be used to detect them, what you do when you do detect them, how, how you can use interview techniques, techniques, accounting techniques, and all the rest of it. Um, so this is the amazing world of forensic accounting. Now, if I can advance, I think this is my last slide. And um, the next section is going to be our case studies. So my associate Maddie here is going to take the screen from me and show just a snapshot of some of the cases we've worked in the past couple of years uh, involving these kinds of uh, these kinds of issues, so that you have a taste for. It. Thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, that's perfect. Um, let's start with the uh, one of the white collar crime case that we investigated. Uh, uh, this is the construction fraud. Uh, this case related to you know uh, a real estate uh, developer that defrauded. Uh, you know, uh, some EB-5 investors, around $40 million uh, via investment and banking fraud, money laundering and tax evasion. We hired by plaintiff to do forensic accounting and fraud investigation. Uh, and then after we uh, finalized our investigation, we submit the case to Eastern District uh, 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 New York office. And because the case uh, was involved to investment area. SEC came to the case because it's related to immigration. Homeland Security involved in the case because uh, some kind of tax evasion uh, happened. IRS uh, come, uh, came into the case and FBI involved in the case. Many governmental and law enforcement came to the case and uh, you know start to their own uh, investigation. And our report has a key part for conviction of defendants. Uh, the person that we investigate, uh, we, there are many people, but uh, I'm talking about the Bob Matthew, the, one of the you know, uh, uh, player, key player for this uh, fraud. He, has a, he had a very good relationship with three presidents, George W. Bush, Clinton, and Donald Trump, and um, very high, uh, high profile people. But right now he's in the jail. Doesn't matter who has you know connection or relation. After we submit the case, and you know, uh, uh, first of all, he tried to fight with government. One, the other parties, at least you know, uh, you know, all of them uh, plead guilty immediately after FBI arrested arrest them. Uh, but Bob Matthew and his wife fighting always you know for one year. But at the end of the day, they plead guilty for conspiracy, money laundering, tax evasion. And I wanted to share with you one of the uh, exhibits that we prepared to show the conspiracy of Bob Matthew and his wife to repurchase one of the houses that was this, uh, foreclosed. For, foreclosed. Um, he tried to create different entity, transfer investors' money from, uh, to different accounts and different companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he participated to the process of the repurchase his foreclosure house with one of the uh, one of his friends and then transfer ownership of the company with himself after he purchased repurchased the house. And this is the very clean uh, evidence that we investigate many different bank accounts, uh, companies and, you know, follow off money. This is a very, very uh, interesting, it was a very in interesting case and uh, it was public. And you, if you search some, you know, named Bob Matthew and, you know, Maya Matthew, you can find many articles and uh, so regarding the case. The other case that we uh, uh, involved that, it was a um, divorce case. Uh, one of the spousal, uh, spousal you know, uh, claim 
um, there is no money, there is no businesses, but we try to do investigation on forensic accounting regarding different bank statements and documents. And we uh, submit the report and our client get a good settlement from the case. Uh, data analytics is very, uh, uh, has a very uh, key role in our uh, uh, services for forensic and fraud investigation. First of all, for example, when um, in the process of divorce, each party, you know, requests uh, in discovery phases, uh, uh, ask the, you know, bank statements, credit card statements from the opposing party. Uh, as you can see, this is, a, this is a heat map that we wanted to show to, to court to the behavior of, uh, of the opposing party. Uh, the, each column that you can see, this is the bank statements and credit card statements. And this is a timeline of period of time, period of uh, time that we request the document. The green one that shows this bank statements and credit card statements um, we received in first time, and uh, we have a missing a lot of missing documents, missing bank statements and credit card statements. And we send a second request. The yellow one. This is the uh, the documents that they send at the second time, the orange, the third, and the red one, this is the document of bank statements and credit card statements that uh, the opposing party didn't send us. And we, at the end of the day, we subpoena these documents directly by the, uh, you know, from the uh, bank. And we focus in this bank statement, this bank account in the period of time, and we figure out uh, the opposing party um, transferred, you know, almost three hundred thousand dollars from each of the bank to foreign accounts in the different countries, and this is the same happened for this period of time that you can see the red that shows the these bank accounts, you know, have a lot of transactions that he don't he didn't want to uh, let us uh, to dig in and know about it, and also the other thing he. Uh, claim, I claimed that, uh, uh, to the court that, and said, I don't have any enough money for disposal support, for child support. But when we figured out and found uh, hidden accounts, we mapped the old expense uh, payments uh, and you know, uh, lavish expenses and lavish travel to Mexico and different payments in, around the country. Also, he paid most of the, his expenses with, by cash. Uh, he transferred, uh, you know, money from different businesses to personal accounts and then withdraw the, the amount. And then after that, we figure out, he purchased, for example, he had a tree in different estates because we can uh, trace the money uh, from the different bank accounts to personal accounts. And then many, you know, uh, the, by, by the other, you know, documents we figure out uh, he did uh, this way to try to you know, remove his uh, footprint. And also in his personal his businesses, uh, also we found a lot of the transactions for personal purposes. Pay for you know, uh, restaurant, Amazon, you know, travel to, uh, to the other countries. And uh, that was that uh, we, we wanted to show, uh, wanted to show to the court to uh, he, had enough money for disposal on uh, child support, and uh, he tried to conceal these payments and uh, these transactions as well. The other case was related to the uh, uh, two uh, to restaurant case, I think. So, uh, and uh, there were there were two parties: one of the investor, one of the you know acting manager that you know managed the restaurant. And we did some forensic, and we figured out the 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 manager divert money from the business to the other businesses that, that, that the same business, the different restaurant in a different location, try to uh, divert the money. And we show uh, how uh, the, the manager pay personal expenses by the business. For, you know, Uber, Starbucks, Wands, many, there are a lot of, you know, uh, transaction that shows he paid and his personal expenses by the you know company account, and also we transfer. We show how money is transferred from the main bank account from the business to 
different accounts and different person and also his wife as well. And uh, for example, this is the uh, Sankey diagram chart for five years, 50,000 transactions in one shot that shows how fellow the money transfer from different parties. And uh, the new concept right now, we are working on it and we use that is animating data. Uh, it's uh, in comparison with the visualization that helps a lot. The animating data uh, get insights from different dimensions simultaneously. For example, this is uh, all payments with different debit cards uh, for, for this case. And um, this is the amount uh, for the, each column shows a represent each debit card and shows the, the total amount that paid with this debit card. This is a very simple and understandable visualization, but we try to animate this kind of data to show three elements, the, the total of the transactions, the amount of transactions and the, the timeline in, in a timeline to show the, the, the more insight about uh, the, the, the person. And this is the visualization. I, first of all, I play the movie. And then after that, I explain what's happening and what's going on uh, in the data. This is the, uh, the column that shows the number of transactions. This is the amount of dollars. And this is the date that we start from January 2018 to uh, uh, end of 2019, to uh, September, October 2019. I play the game and I stop and explain what's going on. Each circle that you can see is a debit card uh, from January 2018 start, uh, you know, uh, the transaction. The yellow card, that's the card is Six five zero seven, the last four digits of debit card, and that shows in February, uh, in the period of time, the, the circle is bigger and bigger. That shows the old expenses paid by one card, and this is the number of transactions, and this is the amount of dollars. And as you can see, in March, April, May, June, July, paid almost three hundred thousand dollars around. 800 transactions. In 800 transactions, paid $300,000 with just one card. He tried to uh, take away and put, put away this card and start with a different card. As you can see, there is no more transactions with this debit card. And he started with the other card. The card is 9738, as you can see. In this, sorry, I put again, play again. The card 973A start to, to do some, you know, transactions, 400 transactions, 100,000, uh, $150,000, 200, 600 transactions, almost $200,000, $200, and then put it again uh, uh, and use the different card, 7380. Uh, this is a different debit card, July, August. Oh, sorry, I, that's it. This is the end of the story. Yeah, that shows uh, in a different way uh, of uh, payments, transactions, that shows simultaneously the number of transactions, the amount of dollars, and the dates in a timeline basis. This is the uh, uh, differences between visualization and animation of data. Uh, Rob, I tried to do, uh, you know, because we have a you know very limited time. But I I try to do very fast explain about the cases, and to you know the other uh, participant have time to have a question or anything we can you know have to. I, I appreciate it, Maddie. So these are like just a snapshot, like like you said, and we have, we re really have not. We made this presentation a couple of years ago to 
uh, a, a similar version of this presentation to, to beta alpha psi. And we haven't really updated our case studies uh, as much as we could have. Uh, there have been some newer cases and just, just as interesting, but uh, we figured that the old data is uh, going to do the trick to show you what kind of stuff we do. There's more. And as we make additional presentations, I think uh, towards the end of May, we have another presentation uh, for beta alpha side, which you guys are all welcome to attend. We'll probably have more case studies along the same lines. But, but this should give you a brief idea of what this field is all about in case you have any interest in it. And um, for the rest of the time we have, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. We've got 15 minutes, so feel free to raise your hand or just pipe up. And obviously chat's always open. One, one question in the chat that I responded to was that, do you guys have any insurance fraud cases? Yeah, we had a couple of cases in our private practice where there was one guy with, with a rug company that he set his own rugs on fire and he was trying to collect from the insurance company. There was, there was some insurance fraud involved. There's another one right now that we're working. It's not insurance fraud, but there's a dispute with the insurance company with this guy. But when I set somebody's pizza shop whose ceiling collapsed, I wasn't just making that up. That was an actual live case that we have. Uh, but I did have a very interesting insurance fraud case back in my uh, IRS days, early IRS days, this was like actually a training case when I first joined the IRS. There was this uh, uh, personal injury attorney that was uh, cashing hundreds of thousands of checks at a check catcher. So he was taking the checks from the clients, taking it to the, <laughs> the check catcher downstairs or down the street from them and cashing the checks and, and hoarding the money. And they were actually able to find him or evidence that he was doing that when they were auditing that check cashier. They found they were going through the deposits of that check cashier and they said, hmm, what is this? Why would an attorney check cash checks? And I ended up with that investigation. It blew up into a big insurance fraud case that uh, eventually went to our criminal investigation division. And they came back to me where I had to go and sit in our local counsel's office for about six months full time to sort through all kinds of subpoena documents to, to take it to court. Wow, sounds like that must have been a really busy case. <laughs> yeah. I guess speaking on that sort of legal side of it, would it be worth getting any sort of legal certifications or looking into like getting an like going to law school for a bit if you wanted to go into forensic accounting or you can just stick to the accounting side of it yeah you you stick to the, the accounting side because being a lawyer really does not help you with this field yes i mean there's some you need to become familiar with some rules of evidence you need to know like the court procedures and but those those are stuff that you can, you can just learn you don't need to become a lawyer for that um what what you'll find out and this is my experience, 30 years working with lawyers in the IRS and about 10 years on the outside working as forensic accountant with lawyers. The lawyers make, do not make good accountants. The stuff that we understand just like this, <laughs> you have to take like two hours to explain to them. And at the end, of, you still don't really know if they got it or not. So um, our skill is to present the accounting data in a way that anyone could understand it anyone with no knowledge of accounting, they should be able to follow it. And that's the skill that comes with us. It's all accounting skills, almost very little uh, legal knowledge because in all those, those cases where, that, where legal knowledge is required, you have attorneys, very competent attorneys working with you and they'll tell you everything that you need to know about law. So uh, I would focus, if you're interested in forensic accounting, um, I wouldn't go after law. I would go after more uh, targeted uh, training towards forensic accounting. I see. We also got another question in the chat about IOLTA accounts for attorney client trusts. Um, 
Okay, so that would be to determine if some some attorney dipped into the the attorney client trust account and took unauthorized distributions from it. What would the issue be? We haven't had really a case involving that. Yeah, but the, I, yeah, the first, um, yeah, the first yeah, case that we that the first case that we uh, that I presented uh, the oil tie count was of the part of our investigation because the different lawyers also mm -hmm. were, uh, uh, were involved in the, uh, the case and we investigate the oil tie account because uh, investors from foreign country bring their money to US and they transfer to the oil tie account and then after that release for their construction project and we need to investigate the oil tie account as well. Oh, great. So this would have been the 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 big eb5 case that maddie was talking about and he was doing that before he and i joined so he was doing that with his old firm uh, so he's got more experience with that yeah exactly cool so before we keep answering more questions i just want to take a group picture for our marketing team since some people are heading out they've got class so i just want to take a quick picture of everyone while we still have everyone, and then we can go right back to answering questions. So if everyone could turn on their camera for like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, that would be great. Yeah, I will be doing a three second uh, countdown. So, <clears throat> all right, three, oh, sorry. Three, two, one. All right, awesome, thank you. You can continue with the uh, questions. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. Let's see. No one else has anything. I was also going to ask, so a lot of your services seem to happen in like really personal and stressful situations and times in people's lives. How do you handle that professionally? Like you're handling divorces, like child support, someone's business yeah. going bust, like... That, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and, and divorces are stressful, but so is when somebody comes to you and he says, you know what? I joined this other person like 13 years ago. We were the best of friends. We started as partners. I trusted them. Now, 13 years later, I figure that he's taken everything out of this business. I haven't taken a penny. He's defrauded me. I hate him. I want him dead. I wish he would suffer. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, it is stressful. I mean, it comes it comes with the territory. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, we're not the ones being hurt, and so we can stay objective. And you you'll find in any field in accounting, whether you're working for the IRS, whether you're a forensic accountant, whether you're an auditor, part of your training and part of your professional responsibility is to stay objective, right? Just because a client comes and says, oh, yeah, this person took everything from me, it doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. It doesn't mean you have to take their side. You look at the evidence. And we've had clients that have come in, hair on fire. Oh, I just hired, we, we have a case right now. I just hired my assistant. He, she took everything. She took $280,000 from me. And it took Maddie and I like half an hour to figure out he's all full of it. He, nobody took anything from him. But he won't believe it. You know, we can't get rid of him. We keep showing him evidence that everything's still there. And then he just goes home and thinks of something, some other nonsense. And he comes back and says, no, no, trust me. She took money from me. Does and he keep the, the funny, your fees? He, well, he, 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 <laughs> funny you should ask that. We, he was a, first of all, he said, well, this person took everything from me. So I don't have any money. So we gave him like a special discount. We gave him like $5,000 retainer. We said, we'll do the bare minimum just to make sure. And if it, we, we even warned him, we said, if this blows up into some big legal or criminal investigation, this isn't going to cover it. This is just going to cover a basic investigation to, to satisfy you either something did or did not happen. Now, of course, he's, he's just not satisfied with that because he thinks he's bought us with his $5,000. But the, the funny thing is this guy is a mental health professional. <laughs> he gives people like medication for anxiety and depression and things like that. And, and Maddie and I have not worked up the courage, courage to tell him yet that uh, maybe he should go take some medication. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but so I mean, just to go to your point, that's a very stressful client. Every time he talks to us, he starts spitting out like insults. Oh, so what do you guys do then? How come you guys? I can find it. You guys can't even find the fraud that's right in front of your nose and this and that. Um, so yeah, the that it's not a stress free job, but you just learn to handle it because you, you, that our our job is to keep our cool uh, heads cool and to go based on evidence and not be swayed by emotions. We go in court. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of times I've been in court and the other attorneys calling me incompetent and, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. Your honor, this guy, he wouldn't know a shoelace from a spaghetti. And, and But we just basically work with evidence and the evidence speaks for itself. So Maria has a question here. Hi, Maria. Hello, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very interesting. And, and thank you for presenting the cases, real cases. My question sure. is, what is the biggest challenge you have faced in work? Big, biggest challenge in what? I'm sorry, Maria, I missed the last part of your question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What is the biggest challenge you have faced um, at your job? challenge maybe difficulties what should we be prepared of course it's not every day but maybe something yeah I'll, I'll tell something. you i'll give you my perspective and i'll see i'll be interested to see what what maddie feels is the biggest challenge to me personally the biggest challenge is usually getting meaningful relevant data and information that we need to do our job so a lot of times either it's a client or most of often the opposing part from our client then we ask for documents they give you a bunch of garbage Sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's because they, they don't know any better, but that's the most frustrating thing is to work through that and, and make them understand what we need. And if they're not, if, if they're either pretending they don't understand or they don't, they understand or they don't want to give it to you, go through the legal channels to get that. But once you get the information, the rest of it is, uh, is pretty fun. I mean, the, the biggest challenge and most frustrating part is just getting documents and information that we need. What about... What do you think, Maddie? What do you, what's the big yeah, challenge? If I want to add something, uh, in, in terms of data, we have two kinds of data, structured data and unstructured data. Working with the structured data, such as you know, Excel file or you know, financial statements, it's pretty easy. But when you want to investigate, do investigation on unstructured data, such as emails, contracts, text message, image, uh, voice, phone call, this is super hard because you need to do uh, different steps to, uh, this, uh, to do uh, on, a, on a structured data to uh, do kind of, you know, investigation or, you know, data analytics, data analysis on it. It's super um, important. It's very important to work with on a structured data because day to day people use emails, email, use image or fo photos or voicing. It's, it's very important. A lot of uh, helpful and, uh, and valuable data inside in unstructured data. And it's very, very challenging for us to access to this kind of data to complete our investigation and represent the case. And right now we, we are involved in a international case that uh, related to oil tanker and we've uh, from inside uh, in some insider we received some phone calls and we are trying to convert the voice to text to text to start to the text mining and I think for the next presentation uh, we finalize the case and we can you know show some uh, aspect of the you know investigation regarding this unstructured data. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Pleasure. Right. So we've got three minutes left. Any last-minute questions from anyone? Actually, we have a question in the chat. It says, do you also have clients that are involved in film financing fraud? That's interesting. I personally haven't had any. Maddie, have you had? Anything with the film industry? In your, uh, your we, we have a, uh, we have cases regarding to entertainment cases uh, and uh, financing fraud as well. 
But uh, as Rob shows to you, we have a, 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 the, the, the whole picture of different kind of fraud. There's a matter of financing regarding the film, financing regarding construction, but any kind of fraud that you imagine and you're thinking about and you hear about is categorized in a fraud tree. And uh, we have a, a, you know, different cases regarding the financing fraud, but not as specifically for film fraud, film financing. So one of one of the first things we do in any case that comes to us is we we do is if we haven't worked with that industry before, we go dig in and find out what the practices are in that industry, where how the financing flows, how the how the money comes from the customer to to the company and gets distributed out, so we can find out what the potential pitfalls are. Uh, so there are a million different types of industries with uh, film and. In, entertainment industry I have not specifically had forensic accounting experience I've had experience auditing a very large movie company that you would all know but that would that was just a the regular tax audit we weren't looking for fraud all right and with that I think we're going to close off questions I'm going to wrap up with announcements one more time for those who came in late. So after, so tomorrow we're doing a multi-accounting club meeting with AA, Alpha, and MISA. We're meeting with Kaiser Permanente on a career and internal audit. It's a more industrial uh, private look in, into internal audit than our previous CSUN one. That's 12 to one via Zoom. It's hosted on Alpha's uh, Zoom codes. It's on the BAM newsletter that's sent out every week. Then on Thursday, we've got a meeting with the IRS five to six on Zoom with our usual sort of evening Zoom information. And then Saturday, we've got our fun event paint day at Northridge Park. We will be providing the supplies. You will not need to provide any skill, just a good attitude. So I hope to see you guys there. And with that, thank you again, Rob and Madi, for your presentation and answering all our questions. You guys were fantastic. Anytime. And thank you again for inviting us. You can always count on us. And uh, you always know where to find me if you need any help with, with any aspect of your club.